everybody. Uh, welcome again. My name is Mike. I'm the program director at Farm Table Foundation. Uh, this is a class with Jenny Breen, who will say a little bit more about herself, but she's um, an instructor at the University of Minnesota and the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing, and is really an accomplished instructor and nutritionist, and we're really glad to have her with us for our first class. She's going to be teaching some for us in the future as well, so keep an eye on our calendar for those. Um, I will mention that in the chat box, I already put a note about her book called Cooking Up the Good Life, and it's by University of Minnesota Press, so possibly you can get it through them or through Jenny directly, uh, and Amazon also carries it. Um, so Farm Table's mission, as most of you probably know, is to build local food culture. Uh, we, we build community, we support conservation, and we teach the craft around, crafts around local food and seek to reconnect people to farmers, the land, and local food, and then tie those tie that daily choice of what we eat to larger issues of equity and justice and caring for the earth. And that's really a lot of what Jenny's career has been about as well. So there's a great match with her. Uh, so thanks for joining us all. Jenny, please feel free to say more about yourself and take it away. Yeah. One of the Hi, everyone. Um, as Mike said, my name is Jenny Breen. I am a, a local chef here in the Twin Cities. I live in Minneapolis. And I am a, was a chef of a restaurant and a catering company here for a really long time, about 20 years, between 1996 and about 20, 2010. Um, but I also really had a strong passion for health and wellness and for education and equity and sustainability and all of these things, and which led me ultimately to getting a master's degree in public health nutrition at the university. And uh, amazingly, those two worlds, the world of the food industry and the world of public health, while in my eyes were very connected, were not actually very connected in, in the world. Uh, and so I spend a lot of my time now kind of going back and forth between those worlds and, and being a bit of a translator. Um, because I believe that these things are very, very connected around issues of personal health, community health, environmental health and all the things that go along with that, the justice issues and the issues of um, health and public health and sustainability. And, and we can't really separate them out. And so in my teaching, they're all, uh, they're all together. Um, I do now, as Mike said, teach three classes at the University of Minnesota through the Center for Spirituality and Healing and also through Food Science and Nutrition. Um, Normally, they are hands-on experiential classes. Uh, this year, we're, I'm teaching and cooking from my kitchen. <laughs> so that's going to be interesting, but here I am doing it. So I'm getting pretty good at it. I've been doing it since March. Uh, I've been reaching a lot more people, amazingly. So there are some benefits, I guess, to this virtual reality. Um, and I like to invite people into my kitchen. So here we are in my kitchen. This is my home and this is where I cook for myself and my family pretty much every day. Um, so I can talk about how it's stocked and all of those things. Um, but I'm interested in a quick introduction from all of you as well. Uh, I, I always like to know who's in the room and why you're here. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, and I think Mike is going to call your names out just so that we can be sort of somewhat organized about this. Just say your name, um, maybe where you are, and what brought you to this class? What interested you about the class? So I'll let Mike call your names. Yeah, so thanks, folks. And we'll need to keep it fairly brief because we have a good sized group on here. So uh, my name is Mike Scott. I live in Amory, Wisconsin, and I work at Farm Table. And I work here, so that brought me to the class. But I'm also really intrigued with Jenny's approach uh, and looking forward to learning more about that. I'm going to mute myself. And if you could unmute yourself when I call you, I'll just go across the top of the screen. So Connie, would you like to in introduce yourself? Sure. My name's Connie. I live in Baldwin, Wisconsin. I am lucky enough to be in Amory once a week, and every time I get there, I get to the farm table. I love it there. I love everything you do. I just need to figure out how to, to live and do everything the right way, and so this is one of my places I'd like to start tonight. 
Thank you. Great. Thanks, Connie. Uh, Terry Power. Hello. Um, I'm a big fan of Farm Table as well. Uh, right now I'm up on the shore of Lake Superior, uh, enjoying this evening. And uh, I'm all interested. I got involved with the Victory Garden this year, which was really great fun. Really pulled me through the summer. And uh, I just real interested in healthful eating and cooking, etc. cetera. Great. Thank you, Terry. Good to see you. Uh, Jen Arnell, or um, Amel. Hi, I'm Jen Amel. Um, I live in Amory. I would love to say that I'm all into natural foods and a good cook, but I am not. I don't like to cook. I, uh, and I'm not a healthy food eater. So I'm hoping this will kind of jumpstart things and make a change. Thank well, happy you. to be here. Thanks. I appreciate your honesty. I think we're all somewhere on that spectrum. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kate, how about yourself? Kate Crosby. Um, hi, uh, I'm in St. Paul. Um, I have a house on Balsam Lake as well, and I often visit Farm Table when I'm there. And my husband and I enjoy it very much. Um, I've been a nutritionist. I've worked at Nutritional Weight and Wellness. I've been a teacher. I've been a massage therapist. But food has always been sort of a theme in my life. I had a catering service at a point in my life. So, and I need a little inspiration in, during this time of... Uh, just cooking the same old, same old. So that's why I'm here. That's great. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Uh, someone's labeled Eric's iPhone. Oh, yeah. That's me. I'm Lori, Lori Carlson. Hi, Lori. And I live in Rice Lake. And um, I have a birthday this month. And my husband, for my birthday, signed me up for this class tonight. So I'm super excited about that. And some of us are coming to dinner uh, on Friday at Farm to Table. So we're really looking forward to tonight and to Friday. Well, thanks. We'll look forward to seeing you on Friday. Uh, Lisa Clark, I believe. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lisa. I actually, I grew up in Amory, but I now work at the University of Minnesota and um, have taken a class with Jenny before. This is fantastic to have the two worlds collide. Um, and it's, it's always great to get some new ideas as well. So thank you. Nice to see you. Yes, good to see you indeed. Uh, Catherine Taylor. Hi, I'm Catherine. I live in Los Angeles and I'm having a baby in the fall. So I'm looking to cook more healthily to feed my family better. Wow, welcome from California. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Tim? Uh, I'm Tim from Alexandria, Virginia. Um, uh, love farmer's market, but also love the sleeves of a big box of fig newtons. <laughs> like to try to stay better on the uh, stuff from the farmer's market. Very good. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Katie Goyne. Um, hi, I'm Katie Goen. Um, I have an issue with eating fast food um, several times a week. And this has happened because I've moved into town now and it's just been convenient to do so. And I used to really cook and I think um, this will help me getting back into um, caring about what I eat and put in my body and what I feed my family. Thank you, Katie. Good to, good to have you with us. Uh, Joanne. Is there a Joanne there? You might be muted, Joanne. It says Joanne's iPad anyway. All right, we'll come back to you, Joanne. Um, Teresa, Teresa, could you unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please? Oh, Joanne, Joanne's there. Okay. Yes, I'm here now. Um, I love the mission of the farm table. And I grew up farm to table because I grew up in the 40s and 50s and was very close with the farm. 
and our food was farm to table. And now I'm so happy to see so many people coming back to that idea. And I would just want some new, um, new ideas of what else I can do farm to table with those vegetables you have there in the front of your, uh, your yeah. table right there. Appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. And folks, uh, Teresa wrote in the chat box, she can't take herself off mute. So she's in Roseville and uh, took a class with Jenny at the Midway YMCA. So knows she'll learn a lot and is glad to be here. Thank you, Teresa. And then we have Lynn Schaefer coming in, I believe from Seattle, as she is my sister, Lynn. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. I'm trying to start my video here. So um, anyway, this is me. I'm in my backyard, yes, in Seattle. And I heard about this class through Mike, who is my brother. And uh, he said, hey, you might like this class. And we have, I don't know if you can see in the background, we have, we have quite a big garden for Seattle standards anyway. And uh, just like to learn more about what to do with see, all that. Now I think I, my picture would work because there's a camera right there. Joanne, you're, now you need to mute yourself, I think. Yeah, I, I muted you, Joanne. Oh, okay. okay, anyway, thanks for inviting me, Mike, and I'm glad to be here. Great, thank you, Lynn. Good to see you. And did I miss anybody? If so, please unmute yourself. Uh, Jay Heyman. Hi, I'm Jan. Jan. Um, I'm here actually my daughter Catherine is uh, coming in from California so that's one way for us to connect is to do zoom sessions together and my friend Terry put me um, in touch with these sessions so I'm really pleased to join and th this summer with um, COVID we revived our garden and so right now uh, my husband and I are enjoying a quiche made with all garden ingredients so it's really cool and looking forward to um, hearing Jenny because I've I've kept I hear about her a lot through our, our co-ops. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thanks everybody for uh, chiming in. And I think uh, Jenny, we are good to go with the introductions. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone. That was really helpful. I really appreciate everyone kind of laying it out there. This is where you're at. Um, uh, and, the, and the name of this class is Finding Calm in the Kitchen, and it talks about stress. And so I want to make sure and, and address that because uh, a lot of you mentioned either certain stressors or certain issues or challenges that you have in relationship with food, which is so incredibly normal and human. Um, so I just want to say that's, that's awesome that you're, you know, that you're talking about it. Um, and that especially now, right, we're in this very strange time where I would say, as was just mentioned, a lot of people are at home more and cooking more just because we have no choice. Um, but we're not necessarily in the rhythm or we haven't, you know, we're doing the same old, same old, or we haven't done it in a while or whatever. And so it can be for people really stressful. And so the first thing I wanna just say is, uh, I don't like to add pressure and stress in relationship to cooking. I think that cooking should be something that's relaxing and, and nourishing and energizing. And so um, my hope when I present to you what I present is that you'll find it um, accessible and you'll find it relatively easy and something that you can do and incorporate uh, and maybe gradually. Right? I'm not going to put a bunch of stuff in front of you and say, okay, now go home tomorrow and do all these things. But I'm going to give you some tools and some resources and some ideas that you can slowly start to add into your repertoire. Um, and everybody's got a different place in, you know, in, their, in their process right now. So wherever you're at, that's kind of where you start. And that's why I'm really happy to answer any questions that come up while I'm cooking, whether it's specifically about what I'm doing or something related to that, like maybe you have an allergy or you don't like a particular ingredient, what would be a good substitute or what kinds of things should I always have on hand? I, I'm actually teaching another class for Farm Table that really talks about building your pantry, but 
that is a kind of an important and foundational theme to any class, right? Is what are the 10 or 12 key things I need to have on hand all the time so that I can just cook food. Um, I am a big fan of using sort of templates and formulas and intuition and not relying super heavily on recipes. Ironically, I also have a cookbook that I love people to buy. So I, I write recipes and I love writing recipes, but I really, um, I really think that there are some simple themes and some simple tricks that you can use when you're cooking so that you can just sort of look at what you have and think about what you want and put things together and make them delicious. So that's kind of how I'm going to talk about uh, these various preparations that I'm doing today. Um, as you all can see, I have a pile of vegetables. So I am, and the other thing I guess I'll just say about, about stress is that um, eating and the food that we put in our bodies is really connected to that and how we are able to handle and manage um, stress and, and how much of our mood is affecting us has a lot to do with the food that we eat, the way that we eat, how much of it we eat, and especially what it is. So, um, you know, people mention either not having big vegetables in their diets or eating fast food a lot, which again is really normal and really human. And I'm not a purist, so I'm not ever gonna stand up here and tell people that you should only eat A, B, or C. But what I will say is we know that our gut is directly connected to our brain, like for real, physiologically speaking. And so what's happening in our gut is really affecting our brain and how our brain processes and, and manages things like stress and vice versa. And so, you know, um, we, it's really important that we understand that these things are connected. And so how we feed our bodies really affects our mental health and our spirits. And again, vice versa. Um, in fact, one of the recipes that I'm going to do tonight specifically has an ingredient that is really super gut friendly and, and has good gut bacteria because we can go so far as to put those ingredients in our food so that we know that we're feeding our gut well. But we also know that whole real food, like vegetables, um, feeds our gut in a really healthy way and therefore feeds all of us. So, you know, stress has sort of external things, but also internal things. And the more that we can balance those things, the better. So ideally, we're going to really emphasize plants and specifically vegetables, but I'm a big fan of what I call plant forward eating. Um, not only is it really good for your mental health and for, you know, dealing with stress, it's good for everything. As Mike mentioned, and as I talked about, the health of the environment is really connected to human health and vice versa. So when we are consuming plants, especially plants that have been grown in a really sustainable way, uh, while that's good for the environment, that's also really good for us. So it's kind of a cool symbiotic relationship that when we take care of ourselves, we're taking care of the planet. When we take care of the planet, we're taking care of ourselves. Seems really simple. Obviously, it's not as simple as it seems, but we have places like Farm Table to really help us access those ingredients. And a lot of you live in communities where there are a lot of farms or I, several people mentioned farmers markets. And so um, especially right now, it's relatively easy to find a lot of really good local whole vegetable food for us. Um, and then, of course, there are the other things, the things that I keep in my pantry, like oils and vinegars that aren't necessarily all local. Um, they're all still whole ingredients, and I'll talk more about that, but um, that's the balance of sort of what things are we choosing, like olive oil, which I think will probably never be local, at least in Minnesota. Um, that's one of those things that I always have in my pantry, even though it's coming from far away. Uh, whereas there are other things where I choose to prioritize local, and I don't buy strawberries in December because I just don't think it's worth it. So. It's an ongoing process of thinking about these things and making decisions and prioritizing, but I'm never gonna say that I'm always right. Um, I'm just gonna give you as much information as I can so that you can make decisions with information um, and hopefully end up with really delicious food. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about 
Uh, well, the very first thing I'm going to talk about is a knife. So um, one of the things that makes cooking stressful or not is having good tools. And the most important tool that you can have in your kitchen is one good knife. You don't need a whole set of fancy knives. Um, you just need one good knife and it will go a long, long way. So I have two here. I actually have more than one good knife in my kitchen, but um, I have two and they're, it's nice because they're a little bit different. They're both really good choices. So what's most important is that you have a high quality steel knife that is one piece from end to end so that it's not a handle attached to a blade, it's all one piece. So that's my Wusthof, my very classic chef's knife in this classic shape. And then I also have, uh, this is called a Global, that's the brand. And this is more of that Asian style shape, right? They're both technically chef's knives. They're almost the same size. This one's six inches, this one's five and a half, but really high quality, really sharp. Uh, when you buy a sharp knife, if you maintain it with a steel, you can keep it sharp for years and years and years. If you have a dull knife, you will never get it sharp. So if you have a good knife that's dull, get it sharpened and then you can maintain it. If you don't have a good knife and you have the ability to invest in one, it is probably the best tool you can get. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use my Wusthof, I guess. You can get a bigger one. This is a six inch, as I mentioned, you can get an eight inch. I have really small hands. So I don't need anything bigger. Um, when I'm cooking, like if I'm catering for 150 people, I actually do have a bigger knife that I use, but in normal circumstances, this is perfectly good. Um, so then I'm, I wanna hold it firmly, just like I'm shaking someone's hand. I wanna hold up close to where the handle meets the blade, even possibly have my hands on the blade itself, okay? And then I want the tip to be attached to the cutting board as if it's hinged, as if I can't remove it. So my knife should not be lifting up and moving around and making noise at all. It should be attached to the cutting board and very, very quiet. And I should just be using a gentle rocking motion with my elbow. So I'm just going back and forth. So that's the, the motion and the technique that I want to use. And then I have to, you know, work with the particular vegetables that I'm cutting. So the first thing I'm going to do before I even start cutting is figure out what I'm making. So I have to know what I'm making in order to know how I'm going to cut my vegetables. A lot of times I have students who just start cutting and then I say, oh, what are you going to do with that? Oh, well, I'm making, uh, you know, I'm roasting vegetables, but they have something that's so thin it's going to turn into a chip. Okay, so we have to know what we're making before we start cutting. So I actually am going to roast vegetables. That's the first thing I'm going to uh, demonstrate. And so in that case, there's a couple things I need to think about. I need to think about the actual size that I want to cut things in. And then I need to be sure that everything is the same size because when I'm roasting or when I'm cooking in any way, if I have different sizes, then one thing is going to cook before the other one does. And therefore I'm going to end up either with something really burnt or something that's not cooked all the way. And the beauty with roasted vegetables is that wonderful sort of soft caramelization that you get. So you really wanna make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so I'm gonna roast vegetables, which means I'm gonna do kind of a medium dice. That's how, that's the shape I'm going for tonight. The other thing that I need to think about is the different vegetables that I'm roasting. So I love roasting root vegetables and that's, potatoes, carrots, sweet potatoes. These actually came from Wisconsin. Um, actually, everything here came from either Minnesota or Wisconsin. There's no reason to buy anything from anywhere else right now. Uh, but these sweet potatoes and root vegetables and my patty pan or my zucchini squash have really, really different cooking times. These are really wet. They have a lot of water in them. These are really dense and dry. So I don't want to put these on the same pan for the same amount of time. Because again, I will have one thing that's really crispy and burnt before the other is done. So my answer to that is just to roast them in separate pans. So I put like with like, in this case, I'm doing my zucchini and squash together and I'm doing my potatoes, sweet potatoes and carrots together. And I also actually have Brussels sprouts which are gonna go with my zucchini but I'm gonna cut them pretty thin. 
Brussels sprouts, that cabbage family, they sort of sit in the middle. Depending on how big of a piece you make, you can kind of go with either of these. So then when I'm cutting, again, I have to look at my vegetable, assess. Most vegetables don't have a flat edge to them, so I have to create one. That's the first thing I want to do. And with a carrot, um, it's pretty, it's kind of hard to do that because they're thin. So I'm going to first just cut my ends off, just the very ends. And then for me, the easiest thing to do, if I know that I'm cutting them into cubes anyway, first thing is getting it into a smaller piece so that it's an easy size for me. And then there I'm going to put the tip of my knife down. Might have to use my hand to push it. And now I've got two flat edges and they're just the right size for me to cube them for roasting. I'm going to take this hand and protect my fingers. I can do that close to the blade or far away, but I don't want my fingertips out. So I can kind of hold the vegetable. And then I'm just going across. So now I've got these sort of medium diced carrots. I've got these wonderful little fingerling potatoes. These are pretty small. So with these, I could just cut them in half and in half again, and I get about the right size pieces. Some of them are really small, some of them are a little bigger, so I can just eyeball it, but make sure I'm getting them in similar sizes. And then again, with my sweet potato, similar thing. I'm going to cut the ends off. This one's really round and wobbly. I'm going to cut it in half this way. Cut it in half this way. And then treat it like I did my carrot. Now I'm using a lot of force. Uh, although I'm still rocking with a gentle motion, I'm using a lot of force because these are dense vegetables. So that's why I need to have a good sharp blade and a firm hold on it. So again, just cutting through like that. So that's how I do those. Similar thing with the zucchini, it's just a lot softer. So it's gonna be less force on my part. So again, I'm gonna cut through it and then Again, maybe a few more slices that way since it's wider. But what I want to point out is that you're not hearing my knife at all. It's just a really light, gentle, gliding motion. It's not this kind of thing. This is really, really hard on your blade and obviously more dangerous for your fingers. So this is a really safe way to cut. Um, so I've got all of those and I'll do a couple of Brussels sprouts too, just to show you. I'm going to do like they do in the TV shows. I already roasted some veggies, so I'm going to do the before and after really quick. But with the Brussels sprouts, in this case, since I'm roasting them with the zucchini, I'm cutting thin, not super thin, not like a, a coleslaw thin, but thin enough that they will roast in a similar time. And what I want to do when I roast any vegetable, is I'm putting olive oil on, and olive oil is the fat that sort of lubricates and, and coats everything. It conducts the heat. Um, and then the salt that I put on is what draws the moisture out, which makes all those delicious sugars inside the vegetables caramelize. And that's what makes roasting vegetables so, so yummy. So the oil and the salt are critical ingredients. And I do a lot of teaching about nutrition, and it's really, really important for people to understand that fat and salt are two critical, critical ingredients, both for our health, but certainly also for cooking and flavor. Um, so I'll talk more about that when I do the sauces. So I've got my vegetables. Again, I'm gonna put them on separate pans, but just for the demonstration's sake, I'll put, these veggies on this pan and then I've got olive oil and I like to put my olive oil in this kind of thing because then it kind of comes out relatively slowly. I've got my salt which is in a dish that I can put my fingers in so I can also control how much salt. I don't, I'm not shy with either of those though. I'm very comfortable with a generous amount of oil and a generous amount of salt because it's very difficult for us when we're cooking our own food to add too much of either of those things. Uh, again, um, 
Fat and salt are really important in our diets and for our health, but only when they come from nature. There's the fat and salt that comes from nature, like olive oil, and then there's the fat and salt that happens in a factory. Those are very, very different. Our body does different things with them. So I'm talking about the good stuff. I put it in about a 400 degree oven and presto changeo. So what I've got is my root vegetables over here and the Brussels sprouts and zucchini over here. I roasted them in separate pans. Um, I didn't stir them a lot. Another thing that you want to do is kind of leave them alone. The more you mess with them, the more you kind of disturb them and break them down. And um, you just leave them, you want them on a single layer. You don't want to pile them up on your pan so that nothing steams. It's all caramelizing and it's all cooking in that fat. And so what I want and what I got is this beautiful sort of caramelization, this browning that happens and kind of crispy around the edges, but really soft in the middle. So that's a really simple way to roast vegetables. And honestly, I can't really think of a vegetable that isn't delicious roasted. So it's one of those things where it doesn't take a lot of time. And if you just can't come up with another thing to do with vegetables, or you have a random assortment of vegetables and you're just sort of I just want something yummy and quick. Um, throw them in a pan with olive oil and salt and throw them in an oven. And by the time you've you know, made your salad or set other things up, they're ready and they're delicious. So it's a, just a really wonderful way to eat pretty much anything. And you can you know, switch with the seasons. So you know, in spring, I'm using, I'm roasting things like asparagus. And in the middle of summer, of course, you have everything. And then once we get to fall, we have root vegetables, which are delicious. So um, you can follow the seasons with it as well. So that's the roasted vegetables. I'm going to set those things aside. Jenny, we have one question or a couple questions about salt. Okay, uh, good. Salt use for someone who needs to limit salt in their diet. And then I've also heard about different kinds of salt and I'm assuming that certain ones are better than others for our health and the earth both. So could you comment on those two things, please? Um, okay, so the first one about limiting salt in, in your diet is, is a, it's complicated. Um, and it, I'm assuming that maybe because you have high blood pressure or some heart concerns and while it is true that you have to be mindful of salt, Again, when we are cooking all our meals at home with our hands, we have 100% control over how much salt is in our food. So when we run into problems in general is when we're eating food that has already been prepared and packaged for us, because then we really don't have control. We really don't know how much salt is in things. So. Um, unless you're on a severely restricted diet, it is almost impossible to eat more salt than you need if you're only salting the food that you cook. So hopefully that makes sense. I don't want to, I don't want to contradict anybody's, um, you know, doctor's advice. And so I would need a little more information about what that restriction is about. Uh, but that is, you know, it is very, very difficult to consume too much salt if you are the only person salting your food. Um, in terms of the kinds of salt, you know, sea salt, obviously salt comes from the sea and so that's the best source of it um, or other places where it naturally exists. Uh, there are some questions, I don't, I'm not a connoisseur of salt, so I don't tend to really buy expensive versions of sea salt, although I know that some people really distinguish and notice differences in the flavors and I'm sure that that's true just like a lot of things I'm sure there's a terroir to salt so it probably tastes a particular way depending on where it comes from um, but just a good basic sea salt is is basically great I there are smaller grinds and larger grinds again depending on what you're doing with them so the larger salt can be really nice the coarse salt can be really nice when you're you know, using it on proteins because again, it has the ability to draw that moisture out or to cure something. Um, but for everyday cooking, I use a finer one. Great, Jenny. And then how long and what temp did you use for those roasted veggies? 
So I put it at about 400, 385 to 400. A little bit depends on your oven. If your oven runs cool, obviously I would, I would make it hotter. Uh, I have a convection oven at home, so I turn the fan on. It's really nice, but you certainly don't have to do that. And about 20 to 25 minutes. It depends, again, on the vegetables. Like the zucchini is probably more like 15 minutes. Um, and then the harder, denser vegetables, like the root vegetables, probably closer to 20, 25 minutes. And again, you want to check it once or twice, stir it a little bit, but you don't have to move it around a lot, especially if it's just in one layer in your pan. Any other questions? Yeah, I try to limit use of aluminum foil. Do you cover the roasted vegetables? And if so, is there a good substitute for foil? I don't cover them. You do not want to cover them because that will steam them and that's the opposite of the caramelizing that you want. So you definitely don't want to cover them. Some people do line their pans with foil just to protect their pan. I was just going to show you. I have um, these really wonderful, they're silicone or silicone liners. Uh, they are, I've looked into it, so they are a natural plant-based product. It's not like a petroleum product. And I, they cost maybe 15 to $20, but they last for years. So it's a really nice way to keep your pan from getting all gunky. It makes it a lot easier to clean your pan. Those can go in a dishwasher um, and you can use them for roasting. I use them for baking. So, you know, I have a few. Um, I did find a similar one, not the same brand, but a similar one at the State Fair a few years ago. Not that anyone's going this year to the State Fair, but, um, but anyway, that's one thing you can do, or you can just use the pan. You don't need to put anything on the pan at all. So if you have a good baking pan, um, preferably a steel pan as opposed to aluminum, then um, you can just throw them right on there. You can also use a glass baking pan. So any baking pan that you have that you like will work. I, you could even use a cast iron skillet. I uh, have multiple cast iron skillets and they go in the oven and they're fantastic for cooking pretty much anything. So. And then uh, does sea salt have iodine? Do we need iodine? Oh, such a good question. So yes. We do. Sea salt, you can buy sea salt with that is iodized. Um, and I think that's fine. Uh, most of us are getting trace iodine from salt anyway, or from some, I, you know, I can't say I know other places where it comes from, but I know that the main concern and the main reason we started iodizing salt was because of goiter, which is not a concern, not an issue that most people deal with now. So some of these things that we have added to our foods uh, emerged at a time when we needed them for very specific nutritional deficiencies. And we just don't have those same deficiencies anymore. So I kind of go back and forth. Sometimes I buy iodine, sometimes I don't. I, I don't run into any health issues because of that. So now I'm gonna go to, this is, um, I started with the roasted vegetables, which is a flip-flop for me. Uh, I think mainly just because I wanted to get the vegetables out in front of you and talk about them since they were out here. Um, and just remind people that sometimes if we just have a few kind of go-to plans and recipes that we can just pull out, um, then we don't have to spend a lot of energy or time thinking about it. And we don't have to, a lot of times, I think what stresses people out about cooking is they have to choose a recipe and then they have to look at the recipe and make sure they have all the ingredients. And if they don't have all the ingredients and they have to go to the store and get them and, and it becomes this whole production. Uh, and you know, if you ask my, I mean, I'm a chef. I teach people how to cook all the time. If you ask my kids what I make for dinner, <laughs> it's probably roasted vegetables 75% of the time with something else, with a salad and something else because they're delicious. Everybody loves them. They work with anything. And, I don't always have time to do anything elaborate either. So um, there's no shame in that, right? We don't have to be doing fancy, complicated meals that are different every single day. I would personally be happy with basically the same meal every day. Um, I have to mix it up a little bit for the audience, the family, but um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not complicated and I think we, actually complicate things for ourselves. I love reading recipes. They're great ideas and information and 
I love accumulating things in my pantry so that I can do all kinds of fun things. Um, but if it stresses you out, it's probably not worth it. That would be my, my general rule about it. So that said, I'm gonna go into a salad dressing. So again, this is a pretty simple recipe and it's a recipe in the sense that it's more of a formula. And when I teach, I teach a lot about formulas as opposed to recipes. Again, we do end up using recipes in my classes, but I start with this idea of balancing elements and flavors because really cooking boils down to that. So, and this is where Zoom is hard because I like to ask questions and have people call out the answers, but we'll, <laughs> we'll just pretend that you're doing that. So that we have five flavors. There are five flavors. Uh, anybody know what they are? Salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Umami is the most recent addition and it is sort of savory or earthy. So those are the five flavors that exist in everything. Um, so when you think about that, it's, it's actually not that complicated and they're all flavors. We can kind of think about where those flavors are in vegetables, right? So when I think about a carrot, it's mostly sweet, maybe a little bit of bitter. Um, when I think about, I've got a lime, lime is very sour, maybe a little bit of sweet in there. Uh, so, you know, when you start to look around at either specific foods or specific condiments that you have, usually they have one or two of those flavors predominantly. And making things taste good is really about combining those flavors or putting things together. Um, but there's other elements to cooking. So elements, so we've got our flavors and then we have elements. And there's a, a fairly recent cookbook that got pretty well known called Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and I love that, except I, instead of saying heat, I say sweet. So I consider those the four elements of cooking. So salt, fat, acid, and sweet. And what I, what I mean by that, we've already talked about fat, but I'll say a little bit more about fat because it's such an amazing thing. So in addition to conducting heat and conveying flavor, which is critical, it also creates satiety, satisfaction. So when we eat a real naturally occurring whole fat, it satisfies us enough that we don't overeat it, right? But it's really, really important for that satisfaction to have a good fat in your cooking. Um, and again, it has all of these functions in cooking too. Um, it also helps you absorb fat soluble vitamins. When we are eating foods that have fat soluble vitamins in them, if we don't eat them with fat, those vitamins are a lot harder to access. So we might as well cook in fat so that we can get those vitamins. Um, so that's fat, salt. I already talked about salt a little bit too, but it draws the moisture out, which is really important for caramelizing and you know, naturally getting those sugars out. It also tenderizes things, so especially proteins, when you salt them, it softens them and makes them more tender when they cook. And it uh, preserves things. It's really fundamentally um, the reason that people were able to create things like sauerkraut or kimchi. The salt is what is helping the fermentation happen. So it's a really, really critical ingredient. And of course, it just draws the flavor out, right? It brings the flavor out of things. When you don't salt things, you notice that you're missing salt. So that's salt and fat. Acid, um, acid is like vinegar or citrus, and it both helps to preserve things. So when you think about something like a salsa or a ceviche, it actually, acid is strong enough to cook raw fish just by squirting lemon on it. So it, it breaks things down, but it also brightens them up and brings out the flavor of things. So a lot of times you'll add a squeeze of lemon at the end of a dish, right? And that just sort of brings the flavor out at the end. Um, and then sweet. And for me, sweet is another really fundamental flavor. I love to have it in 
dishes. I don't overdo it. I'm not excessive. And I use, again, naturally occurring whole versions of sweet like honey or maple syrup. Um, but just balancing a bitter or a sour flavor with a little bit of sweet, in my mind, just elevates it and adds another, another layer to how delicious it is. So now I've got those five flavors and those four elements. And then I'm just taking my food and playing with that. So I've got my carbohydrates, like my whole grains, carbohydrates and vegetables. I've got my proteins, whether that's animal protein, like chicken or meat or fish, or whether that's legumes or nuts and seeds. Uh, I've got those to work with. And then I've got my fat. So fat is also a macronutrient. It's also fundamental, again, for nutrition. So hopefully I didn't just lay a whole bunch of different things on you, but it's five flavors, four elements, and three macronutrients. And a meal is basically some kind of whole grain or starch or carbohydrate, some kind of protein, a whole bunch of vegetables. That's what I'm starting with. That's my palate. And then I'm just coming up with elements of flavor to combine and make them taste delicious. So I'll just use salad dressing as an example. This might help illustrate what I'm talking about. So salad dressing is basically as simple as oil and vinegar, right? Fat and acid. I could just put those two things together and have a fairly decent salad dressing, especially if I'm using good versions of them. So I have olive oil, and in this case, I'm gonna use balsamic vinegar, which is kind of a dark sweet vinegar. And in terms of quantities, this is another thing I usually ask my students, okay, what's the ratio? How much of each should I put in? Um, whoops, did someone have a question? Okay, if, so I will start with about one to one, but what's cool about making your own salad dressing is that you can do however much of each that you want. So I'm gonna start by putting my olive oil in, and then I'm gonna add my balsamic vinegar. And I'm trying to, I'm eyeballing it, even though this isn't a measuring cup. And I'm trying to put about equal amounts of each. Now, if I like a really sour dressing, I can add more vinegar. And if I like it less sour, I can add less vinegar. Um, and if I taste it and I don't like the proportions, I can switch. Uh, so this is my oil and vinegar. And I think you can even see, just from looking, that they don't really blend. So I can mix them. I've got a fork. And I can mix them. And they kind of sort of blend. But it's like oil and water. They're never going to really mix together. So one really cool thing that I can do with food is also use it for its function. So I've got oil and vinegar, pretty decent salad dressing. But as I said, I like more flavors. So I'm going to add mustard. And mustard is like, oops, mustard is like uh, bitter and a little bit of sour. So I've got my fat and my sour, my oil and my sour. I'm going to add a little bit of mustard, maybe like a teaspoonful. <laughs> and then I'm going to mix it. So what's cool about this is not only did I add flavor, but also it's emulsifying the oil and the vinegar. <coughs> so that's, I've got something that's adding flavor and function at the same time. Sorry, I got some in my throat. <coughs> so I could stop there, but I love sweet, and sweet will balance all of those sour and bitter that I just put in here. So I'm going to add maple syrup. Honey would also work really well here. And again, it's about the same amount of syrup that I added of mustard. Same thing, that syrup is going to emulsify, so it's going to help the oil and vinegar blend and add a layer of flavor at the same time. So now I have this really nice, slightly more complex dressing. If I wanted to chop up some fresh garlic, I could. If I have fresh herbs, I could chop those up and throw them in. I definitely want to put salt in as well. Now I have my salad dressing. 
Um, there are so many things I love about the salad dressing. One, of course, is that you get to make it however you like it. The other is that if you look at a bottle of salad dressing that you might buy in the store, you're going to see a lot of other ingredients that are there either to keep it shelf stable or to add certain flavors. Um, typically, there are going to be some artificial ingredients or some chemicals. So we just don't even have to think about those when we make it ourselves. And this costs maybe 25 cents, uh, where that bottle of dressing is anywhere from three to six or seven dollars. So there are lots of reasons why making your own dressing is beneficial. And you can put this in a bottle and keep it in your refrigerator for weeks. So there's sort of no, no losses, especially if you already have these things in your pantry or if as you build your pantry, you add these items, then you can do it as long as you want. So that's my dressing. And I will eventually put it on a salad, but I'm gonna do one other sauce. And this sauce is probably my signature sauce. It's one of my most favorite and delicious sauces to make. And it follows a very similar, similar formula to what I just did, but there are a few really important key ingredients. So as I mentioned, one of the main ingredients in this sauce is something called miso. So miso is a fermented soybean paste. It's a traditional in Japanese food. Um, if I were to pass it around, which normally I would do, you could smell it's got sort of a salty fermented smell to it. Uh, just like other kinds of fermented foods or, or liquids like wine, it's got a terroir, right? It has the flavor of the place that it's been created. Um, there are different kinds of beans and grains that get mixed in and fermented with it, so it has different flavor depending on that. And, um, and it has a range of sort of intensity or depth. So I'm using a brown rice miso, which tends to be a fairly light miso. Um, and what I like about it is, in addition to having this just really unique salty fermented flavor, it's got this really great texture, which is really nice for um, the base of sauces. And the other thing is that is this wonderful fermented food. And so it's full of this really good live bacteria that is so good for your gut. So again, um, traditionally in Japan, it's turned into a soup that people eat for breakfast or lunch. Um, in this case, uh, I'm using it as a base and so I'm using the paste and not adding liquid to it. But that is one of the reasons that, um, that people eat it is because it has this good gut bacteria and it's really nourishing for your microbiome. Uh, we obviously are still learning more about that, but I love to get it into foods wherever I can, especially raw. You don't want to keep this because uh, you kill the bacteria. It doesn't mean it's dangerous for you, but you kill the good gut bacteria. So anytime I can use it as a raw ingredient in a sauce, then I know I'm getting the benefit of that. So that's what I'm starting with. It is a soy food. And so for some people, if you can't do soy, if you're allergic to soy, um, something like an almond butter or cashew butter or tahini, just sesame butter, works as a pretty good alternative because it has that nice similar texture. So either one will work. The other uh, special ingredient that I'm using for this recipe is toasted sesame oil. So again, I keep about three different kinds of oils on hand at any given time, always olive oil, uh, usually a more neutral oil like avocado oil, um, and then I keep toasted sesame oil. I love that whole Asian flavor profile and so I go through toasted sesame oil pretty quickly. I love to use it. It's that sort of nutty aromatic oil that you probably have smelled in a Chinese restaurant. Um, you don't want to overuse it because it is very intense and can be slightly bitter. Uh, so I usually use it in combination with olive oil. So again, I've got my salty, this is very salty part of my combination. And then I'm putting my fat in 
and this fat is particularly bitter. I would say all olive oil is somewhat bitter, but toasted sesame oil is particularly bitter. And then I'm using olive oil too. Jenny, we've got a question about what kind of olive oil is it? And is it a mild flavor or extra virgin or? Um, it is extra virgin. Buy what kind of olive oil should I buy? And I usually say buy what's on sale <laughs> because, um, I mean, it's like wine or anything else. You can get in really in deep to the different flavors of olive oil and the quality and which ones are good and which ones are bad. And I, you know, I think olive oil, I, I would buy a pure one. I wouldn't buy a blend if you can avoid it. Um, and I would just sort of see what you can find. I mean, I usually buy the stuff at the food co-op that's either nature's value, I think it's called, or sometimes there's some organic ones. Um, but anything that comes from California or from, you know, anywhere in the Mediterranean is usually likely to be a pretty decent oil because that's where olives grow. So um, I don't like a really, really bitter oil, uh, but most of what I buy tends to be relatively mild. So I'm not, you know, again, I, I, I choose not to get too particular with these things, mainly because I don't want to alienate people or intimidate them. Um, I mean, I could sit, when I, my family lived in Argentina and I went to olive oil tastings and I loved doing it, you know, and you swish it around in a blue bowl and stuff. But I just, uh, I, it's, it's too high level, I think, for us everyday cooks. Is there another question? Okay. Okay, so I've got my toasted sesame oil, my miso, and my olive oil, and I'm using a whisk this time. I also just wanna reiterate, it's really important to have the right tool for the job. So a lot of times people wanna use a spoon to mix something like this up, and it just won't really get blended that well if you don't have something that's incorporating air. So even a fork would work better than a spoon, but a whisk is really the best. So I've got those. I'm also, again, gonna add mustard, uh, a flavor I really love, um, again, but also it's got some of that bitter, a little bit of that acid. I'm adding a little more acid with rice vinegar so I'm sticking very much with an Asian flavor profile here, but rice vinegar is a pretty mild vinegar. It's not a strong acid. It's almost a sweet vinegar. So um, again, keeping in mind the balance of those flavors. And Jenny, the substitutes for the miso, it was tahini, almond butter, and wasn't there another one too? Cashew butter, you can even do peanut butter. Any nut butter is kind of the best that I can think of. There may be other, you know, I'm thinking both of texture and flavor and kind of the characteristic that would go with these other flavors. Uh, so those are the ones that I think of. Um, and then I've got, so I've got my oils, my mustard, my vinegar and miso, and then my maple syrup. So if you, if you do buy my cookbook, or if you look at my cookbook ever, you will see how much I love all of these ingredients because they show up in a lot of different dishes. Um, but this particular combination is really, really a winner. Um, I have a recipe in the book, and I may demonstrate this if we have time, uh, which is sauteed greens with this sauce on it. And it is, it can claim, I think, converting a lot of people who didn't think they liked kale to being kale lovers because this, it's just so delicious. You've got the bitterness of the greens and the sort of leafy, chewy texture of the greens. And then you've got this, what I consider almost a caramel-like texture of this. And it is a little sweet, it's a little salty, it's a little fermented, it's got all of these different flavors going on, but it does have this element of kind of a caramel sauce, and it's just delicious. And I usually throw toasted almonds on top of that, and then I have this incredible dish. 
I do it with greens or any vegetables. So I could take these roasted vegetables and put this sauce on top. If I have a protein, chicken or fish, the sauce is really delicious on that. So it's kind of this incredibly versatile uh, sauce. Again, something that you can make, I usually tell people make a double batch and put it in a jar in your refrigerator because this also will last. Um, that's the other thing about things that have a fermented ingredient or vinegar in them is that they last a really long time in your refrigerator. So uh, you don't have to worry about using them up that first time. So there's that. And then when I'm gonna, if I'm going to saute with them, I like to cut up both garlic and ginger. So I'm getting that sort of full uh, representation of the Asian flavor profile. Um, garlic, and this I just got this at the farmer's market. So again, uh, two cloves more or less. And you may know this, but just in case you don't, you take your knife and just kind of bang on your clove. The peel should just pop right off. You don't have to get all sticky. Um, ginger, I'm just gonna do about an inch. A fun trick that I learned is just to take a spoon. I don't know if you can see this, but if you take a spoon, you just kind of scrape the skin off the ginger. And then with cutting, again, don't forget that good knife technique. I'm putting the tip on. This time I'm taking my hand and just putting my hand right on top of the knife and just kind of going back and forth over the garlic so that I can mince it pretty small. I can scrape the blade off, gather up that garlic, and then do it again so that I can get it really nice and minced. And with the ginger, I've peeled it. Ginger has kind of fibers running through it, so I want to first follow the direction of those fibers so I can make long thin cuts and then go across, keeping in mind, I'm still keeping the tip of my knife on the cutting board. And then once I have them in those pieces, I can do that same thing of mincing. So for this particular dish, I do like to mince the garlic and ginger fairly small. So I've got those. I'm gonna do this and hopefully this will work. I'm going to put you over at my, can you see my stove? So my cast iron skillets, I'll show you all my cast iron skillets. I'm not joking. I love cast iron. It's the best cooking material there is. Um, so I'm going to, well, actually, sorry. I'm going to cook some kale and put that sauce on it just because we have time. Um, and before I do that, I'm just gonna show you a really simple, quick way to take the leaves of your kale and get them cut up. So a lot of people I notice will take a knife and cut on both sides of the stem very carefully. And really, you can just go like that. And you can just rip your leaves. You can do that with any green, collard greens, Chard, although chard, we actually eat the stem. With kale and collards, the stems are pretty tough and bitter, and so we don't need to eat them. I know you can't see all of my face, but that's okay. And then you can cut this up with a knife, or honestly, you can just rip it with your hands. I don't, personally, I don't like strips of greens. I hate eating something like that because it's just too long. So either I will cut in both directions to get bite-sized pieces or I'll tear with my hands. So in terms of sauteing, another very basic technique, which honestly, next to roasting, is my other favorite way to cook food. Um, you've got, again, you've got that oil that's lubricating everything and conducting heat. It's very simple. Most important thing is to get your pan nice and hot and then get your oil nice and hot before you cook things. You don't want to put everything into a cold pan and then heat it up. You want to get the pan and the oil hot first. So I'm putting, in this case, because I'm doing the greens and I'm using the 
miso dressing, I'm doing both olive oil and toasted sesame oil. And I'm going to get my ginger and garlic in first. This isn't always the case. Sometimes I'll wait a little while to add my ginger and garlic because I don't want it to get burned. Um, but the greens are gonna cook relatively fast. So I'm starting with the ginger and garlic because I don't want them to be raw. And then I'm just gonna take my greens and throw them in there. And you probably hear it sizzling because the oil's nice and hot. Now turn it down a little bit. And also, Again, I want to use the right tool for the job. And when I'm cooking greens in a frying pan, I always want to use a ton because it gives me a lot of ability to turn the greens and cook them without having to try and use a spoon, which doesn't really work. What I'm looking for and I'm not adding any water. If I wanted this to steam a little bit, I could put the lid on and that would steam it. I don't need to add any liquid though because there's plenty of liquid in the vegetables themselves. But what I wanna do is I wanna soften these. I want them to cook. I want them to turn a beautiful bright color and then I stop. I don't want them to keep cooking until they get kind of olive green or army green because then I've overcooked them and then they've lost both nutritional value and flavor and texture for that matter. So I'm gonna cover them for about 15 seconds, not a long time. Uh, we tend to overcook our vegetables really easily. Um, and especially greens and those vegetables in the cabbage family, they don't take that long. I could add other vegetables, onions, I could add any of these carrots or potatoes, but of course I would want those to be cooked well before the greens went in. The other thing about cooking with a really heavy duty pan like a cast iron skillet is that even when I turn the burner off, the skillet is gonna stay hot and it's gonna keep cooking for another minute or so. So I wanna remember that when I'm cooking something because even when I turn the heat off, it's still gonna cook. So now I've got my greens, which hopefully you can see. And I'm gonna move back over now to the table. So I'm turning the computer again. And what are the ingredients in the kale dish? You had ginger and garlic and... Yeah, so I started with ginger and garlic. I will send recipes for all of these. So if people want actual copies of recipes, because they, they, they do exist. Um, they're in my book, but also I, I use them all the time. So I have them written down, but it's basically I use ginger and garlic and greens. Normally I would probably put onions in here too. Um, and then I wait till everything is off the heat to add my sauce so that I don't kill all that good bacteria. And, you know, I would maybe take this out and put it in a bowl normally. Move those so you can see. And then if you want to take some toasted almonds or toasted cashews or some other nuts and crumble those on top, that adds a really nice texture. That's the other thing you're thinking about all the time. So I've got this sort of chewiness of the greens, I've got the tanginess of the miso sauce, and then I've got that sort of crunch, nutty, fatty component of almonds or cashews. And so that just, you know, it really elevates the dish altogether. 
Um, so I might as well dress my salad. And then we've got a whole lot of food to eat. So again, just like with any uh, dish, right now I am buying pretty much all my vegetables locally. There are so much, and I don't know about farm table, but we're in that second phase of salad greens again. You know, we get those salad greens in June and they're really wonderful for a while, and then they kind of go away because it's too hot. And now we're getting to the end of summer and there's that second wave of salad greens. So um, I love it. I make salads most nights to complement whatever dish I'm making. I like to tell people that if there's one thing you should try and eat every single day, it's leafy greens. So we've got a few versions of that tonight. We've got the cooked greens and then we've got the raw salad greens. But anytime you can get leafy greens into your body, your body is gonna be super happy about it. So that's my simple salad. I like to put things like really thinly sliced red onions. Um, it's tomato season. Tomatoes are wonderful. Sometimes I'll crumble some cheese in. Whatever you want. Salads are sort of up to your imagination. Um, and then I will usually uh, dress my salad in the bowl. I think it's a much easier way to distribute this, the dressing and you end up using a lot less. So this is plenty of dressing for more than one salad, so I wouldn't even use the whole thing on here. Uh, and I'm gonna hold off just because once I dress it, I wanna eat it and I'm not gonna stand here and eat in front of you. So I think that's kind of, that's all the content, all of the recipes that I have tonight. I would love to answer questions or hear what other people are um, cooking or thinking about. Anybody have any questions? What are people, have people already eaten or are you gonna go cook now? Jenny, I, um, I, I finally figured out the um, joy of massaging kale. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I'm just been so impressed with what it does. And I, I don't know if you had any other insights around that. Yeah, really important to in some way cook or break down the kale. So um, you, kale salads kind of became a really hot thing a few years ago. And for a long time, I think people were just putting raw kale into salads and it was just, it's really difficult to eat, especially the curly kale. Sometimes there are some other varieties that are a little softer, but massaging the kale and a, a good way to do that is to like add a little bit of salt and you can put it in a bag or you know put gloves on or you can just do it in a bowl but the salt as i mentioned helps to break it down a little bit tenderize it and then you really need to use your muscles and your fingers to break it down because if you don't it's really not very pleasant or very easy to digest so you don't like really really raw kale is just not the best way to eat it the other thing that i will sometimes do is I'll cut it really, really, really fine and throw it into a salad. So if I know I'm just gonna bulk up a salad with raw kale, but I don't feel like massaging it because the texture won't be so great, I'll just cut it very, very small. Um, and you can do that with other greens too, again, with collard greens or chard or mustard greens, but you do wanna help break them down a little because our teeth and our stomachs are not quite prepared for that. I'll add one more thing. <laughs> um, I split a CSA for the first time. I split, a, uh, split it with my sister this summer and it was from the Hmong Farmers Association. And we, that is a fantastic way of being introduced to vegetables that you normally wouldn't pick in a farmer's market. I mean, who knew that um, yam leaves taste fantastic? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to think of some other things, but yeah, it's another way to be introduced to new, new things. Does, does Farm Table have a CSA, Mike? Uh, we don't have a CSA per se. Uh, we purchase most of our, well, a good amount of our produce from uh, 
Blackbrook Farm and they have a CSA and then we purchased some CSAs from them too. I know um, there's a lot of CSAs out in that area. Um, so if, in case people don't know, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And it basically is exactly what Lisa was describing. You buy a share or a box and you get a box of produce every week for about 18 to 20 weeks throughout the summer. So it really forces you to have to cook, right? If you want to get your money's worth and not waste things, you get your box, you look at it and you go, okay, I got to figure out what to do with this. So it's great, Lisa, that you, and I'd say the Hmong American Farmers Association probably is introducing you to even more unusual to you, unusual to us, not unusual to Hmong, um, vegetables that are delicious and just expanding our repertoire so much. Um, so I first was exposed to CSAs about 20 years ago when a, some friends uh, started one, um, actually not far from Amory, and I was quickly hired by the CSA Association to teach classes to people because people were freaking out because all of a sudden they had all of these vegetables and they just didn't know what to do with them. So it really does, it's a great way to force you to really cook um, and to expose you to new things. And the other really awesome thing about it is that you support a farmer or a group of farmers. So it means that the farmers don't have to worry about selling their products, they can focus on growing and harvesting, which is really important. And another, another good thing about CSAs is that it acknowledges that we're all participants in agriculture and it, it shares the risk too. If it's a Exactly. It's not the greatest year, if it's a really dry year or too hot or whatever, you may not get exactly what you want or as much as you want, but it's, that's because you're sharing the risk the farmer faces. And it helps you understand what's available when. It really connects you to the seasons and what grows when. So, you know, when I used to cater, I had people all the time who were having a May wedding and they wanted heirloom tomatoes. And... <laughs> You know, I would say, sorry, we don't have heirloom tomatoes in May, but people don't know that. So um, it helps you kind of get a sense of what the growing season looks like too. Yeah, Jenny, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one about does toasted sesame oil need to be refrigerated and what's its shelf life? That's a good question. So if it takes you, a, so most oils will eventually go rancid if they sit out in room temperature, but I have never had a bottle of oil last that long. So it depends on how long it takes you to go through it. Um, so it never hurts to refrigerate it if it's something you use occasionally. I use oil, so I go through my stuff so quickly that it's just not an issue. So it just depends on that. And how about uh, avocado oil? How do you use it? Can you cook with it? Just a bit more about avocado oil. Yeah, so avocado oil kind of just exploded on the scene a little while ago. It's really high in omega-9 fatty acids, which is this sort of unusual category that we, we need, but we don't really know where it is. Um, so it's a good source of that. It's also a higher heat oil, so people really like that because people are really worried about having oil that they can cook at really high heats. I always tell people that if you're cooking it, if you're worrying about that, you shouldn't be cooking at that heat. So that's not really why I use avocado oil. Uh, I use it because it's a fairly high quality neutral oil. So sometimes if I want something that doesn't have as strong a flavor as olive oil, I will use it. Um, I use it for baking because it's more neutral. Um, and then it just because it, nutritionally, it's got that nice, um, that nice omega-9, which is just a, a thing that we can include in our diet. So it's not the cheapest oil, but I always tell people if there's one place to really invest, um, oil is a good place to do that because low quality oil is really, really bad for us. So any naturally occurring, meaning coming from nature, oil is worth spending on and something like a vegetable oil which is either corn or soy oil or uh, canola oil even are sort of borderline we don't they're not exactly naturally occurring so um, I tend to go with things that I can recognize 
What about sunflower oil and can that be sourced locally? Yeah, sunflower oil is one of, one of the few oils that we can get locally and I, it's a great option. We have a really good uh, smooths is, a, I guess, Minnesota, I'm speaking, um, a producer of sunflower oil and it's a really nice high quality oil I use a lot. Other questions, anyone? Either unmute yourself or type into the chat box. Yeah, um, I was wondering, did you say you bake with olive oil? I, you can bake with olive oil. I, tend, I usually bake with avocado or a morning avocado. oil or okay. butter. Honestly, I use butter a lot too. Big fan of it. Coconut oil, that's another thing I like to bake with. But it has a strong coconut flavor, so. Any other questions? I will um, share recipes with Mike so that he can get them out to anybody who requests them. Uh, I'm also happy to get books to people if you want to buy them directly from me and I can sign them. Um, they have a lot of the kinds of recipes that I presented to you tonight. Lots of great tips for cooking with kids or engaging young people in the food preparation process, which I think is really important. How would uh, people, you know, get, get the book from you, Jenny? Can you let us know about that? Uh, you would just reach out to me directly, I mean, through email, and then we would arrange a way for me to get it to you. Either I'd put it in the mail or I would drop it off. And you want to share your email or should I send that out with the recipes? I can just, it's jennybroccoli at gmail.com. All one word. Like the vegetable, two C's, one L. Jennybroccoli at gmail.com. Great. And then I did want to also mention, folks, some of you may know, but Jenny's going to be teaching her second class with us on October 6th, uh, building your whole foods pantry. So she kind of hinted at that tonight, but you know, what are the 12 to 15 things that if you have in your pantry, any night you come home, you're, you're good to go. Or any night you get up for your Zoom, <laughs> Zoom yeah. class, you can, uh, you can prepare some good meals. And so, that's the goal, always, right? Having lots of options at your fingertips. Yeah, I really appreciate how, how you emphasize sort of the simplicity and not being stressed out about cooking, Jenny, and yet also very healthy and local. Yeah. So it's a, it's a nice mix of things. So any other final questions? You're getting some good thank yous in here, Jenny, from people. Good. Great. Uh, thank you all for, for joining in. I was, you know, it's that for a lot of us, it's the first week of school. And so there is the craziness factor. So hopefully this was a relaxing part of your day. Participation. And thank you, Jenny. It's been a great class. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.